Our dear Father in heaven, thank you for the Sabbath blessings and uh, thank you for your love upon us. And as we study your word, we implore that uh, you may give us the grace that is sufficient for such a time as this. In Jesus' name, amen. And so I'd uh, like to welcome us to the series, the 1888, Minneapolis 1888, and this is uh, number nine in the presentation, which uh, I'm going to look into the risk of uh, eternal loss. And this is something that uh, is so much important. And the reason being that, uh, you know, many times we converse with people and talk about uh, the issues at stake in the great controversy and what costs or what it has costed the uh, humanity to be saved and uh, the implication of uh, God giving his son to die for humanity at Calvary. And so uh, I like to go into this issue of uh, the risk of uh, 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 the, the the risk of uh, eternal loss, and uh, the reason uh, I have to present this is uh, because th there are just many things that were at stake in uh, uh, in uh, God uh, giving His Son to die for us, and God giving His Son to die for us. And um, yeah, did God risk anything? Was uh, Jesus Christ going to lose anything, or uh, there was nothing to be lost uh, in the in the great controversy? And uh, we shall explore the Bible and uh, see what it has to tell us and. Where else can we start? But uh, I'll just go and open up the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 5. That is where I can begin. The book of Hebrews chapter 5. And uh, I look at uh, from verse 7. The book of Hebrews chapter 5 from uh, verse 7. We are told, uh, talking about Jesus Christ, who in the days of uh, his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and uh, supplication with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Now, if this death is a death that you can recover from, then you cannot fear about it. If this death is a death that um, you can come from, then it is not something to be feared. And so if Christ feared this death, then it is something that we have to look into it. What kind of death is this that Christ really feared so much? Though he were a son, yet learned the obedient by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became an oath of eternal salvation unto all them that uh, obey him. So there is, uh, without um, uh, without um, a shadow of doubt, there is a death that Christ feared dying. And this cannot be a temporary death, but eternal separation from his father. And that is what he feared so much until he cried, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? He feared that uh, sin was something so repulsive to God that if it was laid on him, then there was no hope of his own recovery from it. And so God had to save him from this day, but he could only be saved because uh, he was obedient to God. He was obedient to God. And so Reading just that passage once again, that uh, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience. Obedient for what reason? So that he may be able to be saved from the things he feared. 
And so he learned obedient by the things he suffered and was made perfect. And that perfection is what really uh, enabled him to come from this death that he feared. For we know that um, uh, the, the wages of sin is uh, death. Death, which is a separation from the Father eternally. And that is actually the penalty of having sin. So if there, is, if there was any way that Christ could have been spotted, then he could have not resurrected from the dead. And so there were, this is the issue. Uh, this is the risk of eternal loss that Christ feared. And this really does away with this concept that uh, Christ is a God on his own and he is not the son of God. For if he were a God on his own, then uh, he could have not feared to be lost. He could have not feared the death because he could defeat death as God. But because he was a son of God and he could face the same wrath that, the sin can, uh, that uh, a sinner can face, then he had to be obedient. Then he had to fear of this uh, death that we are talking about. Now, um, this is something that actually was raised and uh, 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 not only in Minneapolis 1888, that it was exemplified in a, 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 a manner that was able to be understood. But this is something that E.G. White had uh, uh, been talking about. And uh, um, what risk was faced for our justification? What risk was faced for our justification? Jesus did not count heaven a place more so, a place to be desired while he were, while we were lost. He left the heavenly courts for a life of reproach and insult and a death of shame. He who was rich in heaven's priceless pleasure, treasure became poor that through his poverty we might be rich. We are to follow in the path that he trod. That is Desire of Ages, page 416, paragraph 3. In uh, 753, paragraph 2, we read, Satan, with his fierce temptation, ran the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see, the, see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror or tell him of the Father's acceptance of their sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. I want us to think about that for a moment. That um, Christ, Christ feared that sin was so offensive that it could separate him from the Father eternally. And we know that people will be separated from the Father eternally who sin is found in them. So if sin was found in Jesus Christ, he could suffer the same fate that a common sinner would be able to suffer, and that is eternal separation from the Father. Far be it that he was another second God in what we call the Godhead, or a group of three gods coming together for the plan of redemption. If there were three gods coming together for the plan of redemption, then it could be injustice of one in, 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 in it could be injustice for the other two gods to put at risk another god to be lost eternally for the plan of redemption and then what could he have uh, profited the other two gods for humanity nothing and then it shows some level of selfishness in the other two gods to lose one of their gods so that man can be saved uh, or um, uh, for such a thing. And then the, the other point that I can make is that uh, if God is made up of three gods, then surely if one of them is removed, then we are not having God because many people believe that we have three gods in one. So if you remove one of them, then you are not having God. I want us to try and think out that also in the risk of eternal loss. So, Satan with his fierce temptation wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Christ felt the anguish 
which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. It was the sense of sin bringing the father's wrath upon him as man substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the son of God. And that is why you find that uh, uh, in the garden of Gethsemane, when uh, Christ is uh, praying, in the garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus Christ is praying, uh, we are told that uh, uh, he prayed to the Father, if it is possible that this cup may be taken away, if this cup may be taken away, then do it, not according to my will, but according to your will. And so he cannot pray that the cup be taken away if there is no risk involved in it. But a risk is involved in it. That is why he's saying, take it away from it because I cannot drink of it alone. But God heard him in what he feared and he saved him from it, not taking away the cup from it, but making him to be able to go through the ordeal. In uh, Deserve Ages 131, paragraph 2, we are looking at the risk of eternal loss. Never can the cost of our redemption be realized until the redeemed shall stand with the Redeemer before the throne of God. Then as the glories of the eternal home burst upon our enraptured senses, we shall remember that Jesus left all for us. That he not only became an exile from the heavenly courts, but for us took the risk of failure and eternal loss. Now, we, if, if we fail to conquer sin, then we have an eternal loss. I want to repeat that. That uh, if uh, we fail to conquer sin, then we have the risk of uh, eternal loss. And so if Christ as a substitute could have failed to conquer sin, then here he faced a risk of eternal loss. And if he had eternal loss, and we are assuming that he is one of the three gods, the, the, the three that make up God, then we should we will have no God with us. And so these are the issues at stake, the risk that was taken for our justification. Continue on. Uh, we read that, uh, that he not only became an exile from the heavenly courts, but for us took the risk of a failure and eternal loss. Then we shall cast our crowns at his feet and raise the song, what is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Who can estimate the value of a soul? Go to Gethsemane and there watch with Jesus through those long hours of anguish when he sweat as it were great drops of blood. Look upon the Savior afflicted on the cross. Hear that despairing cry. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Look upon that wound head, wounded head, the pierced side and mud feet. Remember that Christ risked all. Tempted like, tempted like as we are, he staked even his own eternal existence upon the issue of the conflict. Heaven itself was imperiled for our redemption. And so... This is the issue. He staked even his own eternal existence. When you say that you are staking your own eternal existence, then it means that uh, there is a possibility that you can cease to exist. Now, God cannot exist, cease to exist. God is immortal. But here we find that Christ risked the uh, uh, put at stake even his own eternal existence. For our redemption. This shows that Christ is the Son of God in reality, and if he could have been marred by sin, then his existence was, us, was at stake. Heaven itself was in peril that uh, for one sinner Jesus would have yielded life, we may estimate the value of soul. And so, uh, uh, this we are told that uh, heaven itself was imperiled for our redemption. At the foot of the cross, remembering that for one sinner, Jesus would have yielded up his life, we may estimate the value of our soul. Again, but although Christ's divine glory was for a time veiled and eclipsed by his assuming humanity, yet he did not cease to be God when he became man. The human did not take the place of the divine or the divine of the human. This is the mystery of godliness. The two expressions, human and divine, were in Christ closely and inseparably one. And yet they had a distinct individuality. Though Christ humbled himself to become man, 
the Godhead was still his own. Now look at the next statement. His deity could not be lost while he stood faithful and true to his loyalty. The reverse is equally true that his deity could have been lost if he never stood faithful and true to his loyalty. The reverse is the truth of uh, uh, the matter. And so uh, we read that uh, surrounded with sorrow, suffering, and moral pollution, despised and rejected by the men, by the people to whom had been entrusted the oracles of heaven, Jesus could yet speak of himself as the son of man in heaven. He was ready to take once more his divine glory with when his work on earth was done. So his deity could not be lost while he stood faithful. His deity could be lost if he did not stand faithful and true and true to his uh, loyalty. Reading on in uh, Science of the Time, May 10, 1899. For a period of time, Christ was on probation. Now, a person who is on probation is a person who is being tested. When you are on probation, what if you fail the probation? Then you are cut off. He took humanity on himself. He stand the test to stand the test and trial which the first Adam failed to endure. When first Adam failed the probation, he was cut off from the Garden of Eden. If Christ could have not stood during his time of probation, then he could have lost his deity. Now, the words in yellow, had he failed in his test and trial, he would have been disobedient to the voice of God and the world would have been lost. Now, remember, Jesus Christ himself was in the world. So the issue is, if he, the world could have been lost, where could have been Jesus Christ in the same world that could have been lost? If um, he had failed in his work, then the world could have been lost, and he himself in the same world that um, was going to be lost. And so these are the states, these are the issues in the great uh, uh, controversy. And uh, continue to read on. Uh, the risk of eternal failure. The divine nature combined with the human nature made him capable of yielding to Satan's temptation. Here the taste to Christ was far greater than of Adam and Eve. For Christ took our nature fallen but not corrupted and will not be corrupted unless he received the words of Satan in the place of words of God. Now I want you to watch that carefully that Christ would have been corrupted if he had received the word of Satan. Now anything that is corrupted is destroyed. It doesn't matter what it is. So Christ in his corrupted nature would have been destroyed because you don't take things which are rotten and keep them safe in the house. So for Christ took our nature fallen but not corrupted and will not be corrupted unless he received the words of Satan in the place of the words of God. So anyone who substitutes the word of God with the words of Satan, then he would be disobedient to God and he cannot live with God. To suppose he was not capable of yielding to temptation places him where he cannot be a perfect example for man, and the force and the power of his part of Christ's humiliation, which is the most eventful, is no instruction of help to human beings. It could have not been any value for human beings if he could have been corrupted. Because the world could have been lost he with the world itself, he could have been corrupted, and the things which are corrupted are destroyed. Christ object lesson, that was in 16 MR 182.3. Christ object lessons, uh, 196 paragraph 4. The value of a soul, who can estimate? Will you know it is worth? Go to get semen and there watch with Christ through those hours of anguish when he sweat as he to a great drops of blood. Look upon the Savior uplifted on the cross. Hear that despairing cry, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Mark 15.34. Look upon the wounded head, the pierced side, the mud feet. Remember that Christ risked all for our redemption. Heaven itself was imperial. At the foot of the cross, remembering that for a one sinner, Christ will have laid down his life. You may estimate the value of a soul. That is a repetition. 
And so signs of the time, April 14, 18, uh, 1898, paragraph six. We read, satanic agencies confederated with evil men to lead the people to believe that Christ was the chief of sinners and to make him an object of uh, detestation. But uh, the priests and rulers failed to realize that in Christ, divinity was enthroned in humanity. Christ's humanity could not be separated from his divinity. And this is where the crux of the matter is. Christ's humanity could not be separated from his divinity. Could one sin have been found in Christ, the world would have, plan would have uh, plunged into blackness and ruin. Now, I want us to think through this for a moment. I want us just to think about uh, this for a moment, that um, uh, if uh, humanity is inseparably combined with divinity, and then Christ sins, there is no way the two can be separated because they are inseparably one. Let us read and reread again the quote. Christ's humanity could not be separated from his divinity. Could one sin have been found in Christ, the world would have plunged into blackness and ruin. So here, divinity, humanity cannot be separated from humanity. Not able. And so if sin could be found in Christ, talk of where you want it to be, whether it be in divinity, whether it be in humanity, if sin could be found in any of these two natures, there is no way you can separate them. They are inseparably one, which means that whichever way, if one nature could be destroyed, then the other could be destroyed too. I want us to get that clear because some people ask, where could have been the date of Christ? Where would have the date of Christ gone if he had sinned in his humanity? That is the clever question that people ask to mean that humanity could have been destroyed and Christ could have retained his divinity or his deity and go back to the Father because deity could not sin or could not be found with sin. So that part that had sinned, the human nature, could be destroyed, but he could retain his deity and go back to the Father because uh, deity is immortal. In quotes, deity is mortal and it's a substance or whichever thing that you want to say that cannot see corruption. And so it could have lived forever, which means that Christ, human nature, nature could be destroyed, but divinity or his deity could have lived forever. But remember, the previous quote says his deity could have not been lost if he remained faithful. The reverse is that if he could have seen, date could have been lost. But you may say that one is a complicated matter on uh, his deity would have not been lost if he remained faithful. We come to this issue that the human nature was combined with his divine nature inseparably one. It could not be separated. So here is the issue. If Christ could have seen, and yet we say, Date cannot be lost or date cannot be destroyed, then what we are saying, we could have had an immortal sinner with us, and that is Jesus Christ. Because here he is a deity, and here he has a human nature which have sinned. So what, what are we going to do? Because they are inseparably one, they cannot be separated, and yet date has to live, then we will be having an immortal sinner with us. But that will contradict with the scriptures because the wages of sin is death. And in Ezekiel, we are told that the soul that sinneth shall die. Now, that is a blatant contradiction of the scriptures to say that we will have an immortal sin. So, if human nature cannot be separated from the divine nature, then the deity is to be lost, the human nature is to be lost. 
there is no the in between of the matter. That any soul that sin it shall die. It doesn't say that the human nature, if it sins, it will be lost, and the divine nature, if it sins, it cannot be lost. That is not what the scripture says. We read the scripture, what it says that the soul that sin it, it doesn't matter if it is divine or human. You can take the example of the angels. Angels are not humans. Angels are not humans, but they shall be lost. In whichever nature they are in, because they sin, they will be lost. So take Jesus Christ. And in his human nature, sin is found in him. It doesn't matter. The soul that sinneth shall die. Christ does not have a separate existence in the divine nature and another separate existence uh, 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 um, uh, uh, in human nature. This is not dual, uh, 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 dualism as we may, dualistic nature, where actually other nature can exist in another nature even though the other nature is corrupted. That is philosophy of highest order. And so because the human nature cannot be separated from the divine nature and the divine nature cannot be separated from human nature, this is the risk for our justification. That Christ put his life, his deity, in peril at the risk of eternal loss so that we may be saved. And you say, why does this matter? If we view this is the issues at stake with the, uh, 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 our justification, then we will see a loving God and a Jesus Christ who can risk all than what Satan had accused him earlier, that he had made laws that... Um, he cannot be a sufferer of the same laws. God did not make laws which he cannot suffer from them when they are broken. He could have lost a son if his son could have broken the law. And that could have been a huge impact on God himself. I cannot estimate or talk about the impact it could have had on the father himself. But we are told heaven itself was imperial. And the accusations of Satan could have been true that God has put in place things that uh, cannot be manageable. And so let us think, let that sink in for a moment that uh, Christ's humanity could not be separated from his divinity. So if any nature was found in sin or corruption, then uh, 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 everything could have gone haywire. If Satan could have so bruised Christ's heel that he would have yielded to the physical torture, his triumph would have been complete. And who are these people that Satan is triumphant on? The people who are seen as the people who have, they have managed to lead them to hell. He could have shouted victory. And Satan does not have victory over people who are going to live eternally. Satan only has victory over the people who are going to die. And so Christ, Satan could have shouted victory over Jesus Christ, not because Christ was going to live forever, but because Christ was going to be lost forever. The world would have been his kingdom. Imagine that if Satan if could have managed to have power over Christ. But Satan could only cause pain. He could not touch Christ's head unless Christ proved false to God. Satan and his angels united with the priests and rulers in mocking and deriding the Son of God. He filled them with vile and loathsome speeches. He inspired their tongues, but by all this he gained nothing. He was permitted to bruise Christ's heel, but Christ was bruising his head. By working through the priest against Christ, Satan was effecting his own downfall. And so, another important statement, Christ has found his pearl of great price in lost perishing soul. He sold all that he could. He had to come into the possession of that pearl. He even engaged to work. He even engaged to do the work himself and to run the risk of losing his own life in the conflict. I want to pause that and put it in bold. Just want to pause and uh, put this one in uh, color so that uh, 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 we may know what we are talking about. And so look at this once again uh, on the screen. Let us read again. 
Christ has found his pearl of great price in lost perishing souls. And you can read that in uh, Isaiah chapter 53, verses uh, 10 and 11. I want just to be sure I'm giving the correct verse in this uh, instance. Um, Isaiah 53, verse 11, not 10. And uh, this is what it says. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear the iniquities. And what I wanted us to say, he shall see of the travail of his soul and he shall be satisfied. This is what E.G. White is talking about when uh, she says that um, Christ has found his pearl of great price in lost perishing soul. He shall see the salvation of this soul and be satisfied. He saw all that he had to come into possession of that part. He even engaged to the work, to do the work himself and to run the risk of losing his own life in the conflict. Now, talking about this life, in John chapter 5, we are told this, John chapter 5, John 5.26, John 5.26, for as the father hath life in himself, so he hath given to the son to have life in himself. Now, what kind of life does the father have? The original and borrowed and drive life, immortal life. So if Jesus Christ is running the risk of losing his own life in the conflict, then we are talking about him losing the original and borrowed and derived life. We are not talking here about human life, but we are talking about here the life of God that was inherent in him. This is what he was going to lose if he had been defeated in the conflict. How then should man regard his fellow man? Christ has demonstrated the way. He says a new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you. When we think about the risk of losing his, losing his own life in the conflict, then the thing that should come into our hearts is a demonstration of the same love he demonstrated by risking losing his own life in the conflict. This is what the risk of eternal loss should produce in our life. A love that demonstrates the love of um, the Father. When these words are heeded and obeyed in the spirit and in the letter, we will be doers of the word and not hearers only. When we think about the risk of eternal loss in this conflict, we shall be propelled to be doers of the word and not hearers only. When these words are practiced by those who claim to have wisdom to guide the sheep of the Lord's pasture, they have far less selfishness for less boasting, far less boasting, far less putting forth the finger and speaking vanity. Continued on. He became subject to temptation, endangering as it were his divine attributes. Now, if you endanger your divine attributes, let us talk about uh, things with, that we understand more better. Let us say, if today I uh, told you, you are in danger of your office. You are in danger of the position you hold in your office. I'll be telling you, Brother, take care, you are about to lose your job. If I tell you that you are at risk of the position you have in your office, I'm not talking about you being elevated to a higher position. But sometimes we talk about the risk of eternal failure and the risk of eternal loss, and we think that uh, something of Christ could have been put aside and another one elevated to a higher state, even if he could have failed. No. As it is, in the natural, so is in the spiritual, that if Christ was in danger of losing his divine attributes, then it is not gaining them. You see, we cannot change the language to mean anything else. He became subject to temptation, endangering as it was his divine attribute. This does not say that his divine attributes could be elevated, but they were endangered. When you endanger something, let us talk about animals which are endangered, species which are endangered. We hear about uh, certain species of animals are endangered. And what does that mean? They are, they are at risk 
of being extinct. Note they are at an advantageous position to add more. When we talk about endangered species, then we are talking about uh, species that are about to come to an extinct. And so if Christ is endangering his attributes, then it is logical that he is in danger of losing who he is. And uh, I think uh, uh, there is a, a statement that we can bear with. Certain sort by the constant and curious devices of his cunning to make Christ yield to temptation. Man must pass over the ground over which Christ has passed. As Christ overcame every temptation which Satan brought against him, so man is to overcome. And those who strive honestly to overcome are brought into oneness with Christ that the angels in heaven can never uh, know. Can uh, never know. Continued on, we read, and all that risk was for us and for the angels. The risk was not only for humanity, but also for the angels. In Hebrews 9.22, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore unnecessary, it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in heaven should be purified with this, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than this, because sin originated in heaven. And if uh, Christ will have uh, come short of perfection, then the things of heaven could not have been purified because they had to be purified or with better sacrifices than this, which are these, the goats and the lambs and the bullocks and the heifers. They could not claim the things of heaven because they are inferior sacrifices compared to the divine beings of heaven like angels. Now, some people will say, why will the angels need uh, purification? It is only by looking unto Christ that they are preserved from apostasy. If there is nothing to look upon, they will fall in apostasy, and that is what we want to see. In Ephesians 1.8, we are told, wherein he hath ab abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time he might gather together in one all things, in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So, by the death of Jesus Christ, the things which are in heaven and which are on earth are gathered together. So, without the death of Jesus Christ, the things which are both in heaven and which are on earth could not be gathered together. Together, I want us to see that 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 is that is the risk of eternal failure. That is the risk of eternal failure. That uh, angels are involved in this plan too. Angels are involved in this plan too to gather together the things of heaven and the things of uh, the earth uh, uh, together. And uh, that, that is something that uh, is uh, amazing to me, that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ not only covers a person uh, who is uh, sinful, but uh, these sacrifices or this sacrifice also, it is work is to uh, prevent apostasy from happening. This sacrifice is to prevent sin from uh, happening. Continued on, Colossians 1.20, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And so the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on Calvary, it is called a reconciliation a reconciliation of both things in heaven and things on earth. And you remember the angels that remained in heaven. They had some sympathies for Satan. And so that sympathy, it must be uprooted, and it can only be uprooted by the death of Jesus Christ on Calvary so that the true picture of Satan may be painted out, and that is what we call the reconciliation of the things in heaven and the things on earth. And so PP 68, paragraph 2. 
but the plan of redemption had yet a broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. So sometimes we think that uh, uh, Jesus Christ coming on earth is only about humanity. But uh, Patrick's and Prophet is telling us that is not the case at all. We read again, but the plan of redemption had yet broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. To this result of this great sacrifice, it is influenced upon the intelligences of other worlds as well as upon man. The Savior looked forward when just before the crucifixion, he said, now is the judgment of this world, now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me, John 12, 31 and 32. The act of Christ in dying for the salvation of man will not only make heaven accessible to man, but before all the universe, it will justify God and his son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. And so if things could have remained the way they are and Christ could have not come to die on Calvary, then there is no way God and his son will have justified uh, his dealing with Satan. It will establish the perpetuity of the law of God and will reveal the nature of the results of sin. So for the angels in heaven to understand God's and his son's dealing with Satan, Christ must die on the Calvary. He must take the risk of eternal failure for them to understand. So reconciliation, justification, and atonement does not only cover the wrongs that have been done, but prevents the wrongs that could be. And that is why we are told that uh, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on Calvary is enough atonement for us to make us have victory over the things we have not done. Because it covers the sins we have done and it gives the strength to prevent that which we could have done if we remain sinful. So justification gives us victory for the sins that we have done and victory for the sins we would have done. And that is when how angels come in. They could fall into apostasy, but the cross prevents them from doing that. I hope uh, uh, that uh, illustration sticks. While we rejoice that there are worlds which have never fallen, this world render praise and honor and glory to Jesus Christ for the plan of redemption to save fallen sons of Adam, as well as to confirm themselves in their position and character of purity. Think about that for a moment, that while the sacrifice, it covers those who are already fallen, it also covers and confirms purity of character in those who have not fallen. So the angels of heaven needs also this atonement because it covers uh, their purity. Also, it covers their purity. Also, this is something so amazing to me. And uh, it is something to really uh, think about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, how important it is that God has not just provided an immunity for the sinner, but he has provided a sure uh, immunity to, uh, to, to, to those people uh, or those beings uh, which have uh, not seen. And this is uh, something... Uh, uh, to think about in this uh, uh, moment. So, um, I'd like to continue somewhere. I hope uh, this really resonates with us. Uh, this really uh, resonates with our, our mind. While we rejoice that there are worlds which have never fallen, this world render praise and honor and glory to Jesus Christ for the plan of redemption, to save the fallen sons of Adam, as well as to confirm themselves in their position and character of purity. The arm that raised the human family from the ruin which Satan had 
brought upon the race through his temptation is the arm which has preserved the inhabitants of the other world from sin. Every world throughout immensity engages the care and support of the Father and the Son, and this care is constantly exercised for fallen humanity. Christ is mediating in behalf of man, and the order of unseen world also is preserved by his meditative work. And not these deems of sufficient magnitude and importance to engage our mind, our thoughts, and call forth our gratitude and adoration to God. And so it is clear that without the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on Calvary, there would have not been a, 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 an arm of provision for unfallen beings or the order in the other worlds. And we are told that this sacrifice is the one that preserves uh, uh, preserves the, the preserve the order of unseen work, the meditarial work. So we cannot say that the mediation is only for the sinners, but also for those who are, have not fallen into sin. To the angels and the unfallen world, the cry, it is finished, had a deep significance. It was for them as well as for us that a great work of redemption has been accomplished. So uh, 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 it is not only for us. The plan of redemption is bigger than the human beings. The significance of the death of Christ will be seen by saints and angels. The angels ascribe honor and glory to Christ, for even they are not secure except by looking to the suffering of the Son of God. It is through the efficacy of the cross that the angels of heaven are guarded from apostasy. Without the cross, they will be no more secure against evil than were the angels before the fall of Satan. So angels are not secure, and they could have never been secure if the cross could have not been involved. So it is the cross of Jesus Christ that has secured the angelic realm and uh, has guarded them from uh, falling into uh, apostasy. Not only man, and, but angels will ascribe honor and glory to the Redeemer, for even they are, they are secure only through the suffering of the Son of God. It is through the efficacy of the cross that the inhabitants of unfallen worlds have been guarded from apostasy. Not only those that are washed by the blood of Christ, but also the holy angels, are drawn to him by the crowning act of giving his life for the sins of um, the, the world. And so, not only men, but angels will ascribe honor and glory to the Redeemer, for even they are secure only through the suffering of the Son of God. It is through the efficacy of the cross that the inhabitants of unfallen ones have been guarded from apostasy. Not only those who are washed by the blood of Christ, but also the holy angels also draw, are drawn to him by his crowning act of giving his life. And so this is it. Could Satan in the least particular have tempted Christ to sin, he would have bruised the Savior's head. As it was, he could only touch his heel. Had the head of Christ been touched, the hope of the human race would have been perished. Divine wrath would have come upon Christ as it came upon Adam. And what, what really happened to Adam? What really happened to Adam? Adam was taken away from the Garden of Eden. Adam was taken from the Garden of Eden. And so Christ could have never had a blissful abode with the Father if Satan could have bruised his head. This is the risk of eternal loss. This is the risk for our justification. It does not only cover humanity, but also it covers angels. And so we can see that uh, this whole story of uh, three gods and Christ being God on his own merit and all that stuff does not fit in the frame of uh, uh, having a son who has a risk of eternal loss. And so may God help us. The issue is not about even God help. The issue is about what is the risk of uh, 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 what uh, risk was taken for our justification. May the Lord help us to understand these things because we are told that when we understand them, we shall grow in deep love with the one who has saved us. And so may the Lord 
bless us shall we pray god in heaven we thank you because uh, you are so merciful and you are good unto us we just pray that the things that we learn may resonate with us and uh, they may create an impact in us in glory and honor be unto thy name for accepting us and risking all for our salvation in jesus name amen <laughs>